All right. Hi, everybody, um, and happy Wednesday. We're really excited uh, to have you all here for um, our final coffee talk on uh, celebrating neurodiversity. Um, we're especially excited today because we will um, have a wonderful presentation and then we will have um, spend about 20 to 25 minutes in breakout sessions, um, having some uh, discussions led by um, led by some autistic advocates as well as some parent advocates. Um, so we're really excited uh, for that opportunity to hear uh, from the community today. Um, so before we get started, just wanted to point out a few tech um, notes. Uh, we do have closed captioning today, um, so you can enable that on your screen. Please let us know if you are having any issues accessing that. Um, we do have a third party viewer link that we can share. Um, we are in Zoom meeting today, um, so everyone has the ability to turn on your camera as well as audio, and we encourage you uh, to have your camera on, especially during breakout sessions. Um, of course, that is only if you are comfortable and, and open to that today. Um, we just think that sometimes it helps to uh, have conversations and see other spaces while we're talking. Um, but that is, of course, uh, just personal preference for folks. Um, if you need to change your name, you can do that with the participants tab. And then um, please uh, feel free to introduce yourself in the chat box um, or uh, add any thoughts in as we go along. Um, so uh, because we tend to have uh, new folks uh, every time we meet, which is really exciting, I did just want to introduce our organization to everybody. Um, so we are the Association of Maternal and Child Health Programs. Um, and up on the slide here, I have our vision, our mission, and um, I'll just highlight that um, we are an association and our members come from um, state and territory health agencies. Um, and these are folks who are working to implement programs to improve the health of women, children, and families. And specifically at our organization, AMCHIP, um, the project that's uh, sponsoring the coffee talk today is our State Public Health Autism Resource Center, which is funded through um, the Maternal and Child Health Bureau. Um, and I have our aim up here on the slide and um, we're really excited uh, for all of the great opportunities that we've had um, to offer for Autism Acceptance Month. And we're especially um, grateful for all of our uh, facilitators today um, who have been open and willing to discussing and designing this series with us. So um, thank you to everyone uh, who is on today. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to um, our expert speaker today, uh, Ms. Yetta Myrick. Um, and I will turn it over to Yetta to give us uh, a presentation. Uh, thanks, thanks so much, Paige. Good afternoon, everyone. Really excited to be here. Um, I just want to disclose that I am a parent of a youth who is autistic. Um, I do not, I was not diagnosed with autism, but uh, what I share today um, is through my experience of, of raising my son. So, of course, we're going to start with what autism is, and I'm giving you all the CDC's definition. Um, so according to the, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, autism is a developmental disability that can cause significant social communication and behavioral challenges. And it is estimated that one in 54 children are diagnosed with an autism spectrum disorder. In 2020, I'd like to note for the first time, CDC found that the same autism prevalence in black, that the same autism prevalence um, numbers were the same in, in black and white children. However, it's important to note that black children who were identi identified received evaluations at older ages than white children, which means that black children who are not diagnosed with the intellectual disability may not be identified at the same rate as white children. So I'm gonna share our story um, in a moment, but please make note of that difference. So, what is neurodiversity? Neurodiversity is a viewpoint that brain differences are normal rather than deficits. Judy Singer, an autistic sociologist, coined the term neurodiversity in the late 1990s. She rejected the idea that people with autism were disabled. Singer believed their brains simply worked differently from others. The term was quickly embraced by activists in the autism community and advocates have used it to fight stigma 
and promote inclusion in school, work, and the community at large. The movement emphasizes the goal that there should not be a cure for autism just because people's brains work differently. The goal is to embrace them as part of the mainstream. And that means providing needed supports so that they can fully participate as members of the community. I've always said that the challenge has never been Aiden being autistic, rather the systems I have had to navigate to support him. Which brings us to our story. This photo is of my son Aiden and I at the National Portrait Gallery in Washington, D.C. back in February 2019, right before the pandemic hit. Aiden is now 17 and was diagnosed with an autism spectrum disorder on July 6, 2007. About a year and a half earlier, um, he had been diagnosed with an expressive receptive speech delay. I was fortunate enough to find a speech and language pathologist but she practiced over the line. So we're in Washington, D.C., but the speech and language pathologist was in Maryland, and she didn't know how to access D.C.'s early intervention system. I'm not going to lie to you. I mourned the speech delay. But when I finally got the autism diagnosis, I felt a sense of relief. After nearly a year of taking him to all these appointments to get different types of tests done, um, Aiden finally had a diagnosis and I was going to do everything in my power to help him. And preparing for this talk, I don't know if Lydia is on um, yet, but I remembered meeting her for the first time. I believe it was back in 2011 when DCAP hosted one of its first um, barbecue events for families. I remember us talking about Aiden and I said, with autism. And Lydia said, his autism is not luggage. You do not carry it around with you. He is autistic. It is who he is. And I have always taken that and remembered that. Aiden was almost four when he was diagnosed. Considering the prevalence numbers I shared earlier, I am blessed that I was able to get him diagnosed within the time frame that I was able to. Nearly a year later, Aiden and I were at his well child visit in September of 2006. And I shared with the nurse that Aiden's um, speech and language pathologist thought that he might be on the autism spectrum. And the nurse said to me, mom, you can't just let anyone diagnose your child. When Aiden's doctor came in, I didn't have a conversation with him about what the speech and language pathologist shared with me. I just, I was like, okay, like it, it just really, put me in a space where I didn't feel comfortable to talk to the doctor. Like it really put me off to be quite honest, you know, but if I knew then what I knew now, I would have pushed. That moment delayed me in seeking his diagnosis, which brings me now um, to the Learn the Science Act early materials. There's no doubt in my mind that if these materials existed, I would have showed the nurse and the pediatrician a milestone checklist and we'd, we would have started that process sooner. If, I, if you all have little ones in your lives, I urge you to use these mater materials to monitor their development. The CDC created these materials to improve early identification of the developmental delays and disabilities, including autism by increasing parent engaged developmental monitoring so the children and their families can get the early services and supports that they need. All of the materials are free. They can be downloaded and ordered online from the website. And I do have a resource page that'll take you directly to the Learn to Science Act early page. And they are not only in English and in Spanish, but some of the materials are available in Arabic, Korean, Portuguese, Somali, and Vietnamese. I also want to recognize that we all exist within the context of our families. We have reciprocal roles within our family system. The entire family, individually and as a whole, needs the support to ensure that they are all able to successfully live their good life. The Charting the Life Course framework was created by the Institute for Human Development at the University of Missouri in Kansas City. A, uni a university center of excellence in partnership with families. It is driven by the core belief that all people have the right to live, love, work, 
play, and pr pursue their life aspirations. The Charting the Life course tools are designed to help individuals and their families articulate their vision of what they want or don't want, identify access key supports, and have conversations with their families and supporters about planning for a good life now and in the future. Charting the Life course is about having different types of conversations. It's a different way of thinking, a mindset change. It encourages high expectations and having life experiences to move the trajectory in the desired direction of that individual. So how do I support self-advocacy in Aiden? First of all, I presume comp competence. We all need to assume that an autistic person has the ability to think, learn and understand, even if we don't see any tangible evidence that that is the case. In society, we measure intelligence based on how well someone verbally communicates, but that is not the way. Just because someone does not express themselves verbally does not mean that they do not have anything to say. I have high expectations for Aiden and wanted him to be from the very beginning, regardless of him being autistic or not, right? Because let's be honest, some people, and we'll talk about these in the, this in the breakout room, some people do not look at it as a strength. And that is one of the things that I have always done. Aiden is Aiden, right? And so, you know, I think about throughout his, you know, his, his 17 years, soon to be 18, you know, how much he has grown, how independent he has become. And that's because I, along with the support of, of my family and, and, and providers and friends, all these people in his life, have always had these high expectations that really worked to support him in his independence. So I think back to all the years, one of the things that we have to do is fill out a lot of forms. Aiden is 17 now, and we have an IEP goal where he now fills out forms. We had to teach him that, right? But he can fill out these forms. And this is something that we've targeted through um, his school IEP. And I then work to generalize it into everyday life. Another thing that, that I think that is important in um, supporting self-advocacy and I, and I do with him is I don't speak for him. You know, I find ways to support him in, in speaking for himself. So we have an app called Pictillo that Aiden uses. Um, and if you, if you ask him to tell you about himself, he can hold up his iPhone and he literally will show you and it will tell you, will tell the listener about who he is and the best ways to work with him. You can also support your child or your youth strengths um, by looking at what they're good at. What are they interested in? Support them in, in exploring those interests. Sometimes you might have to get a little bit creative, but it can be done. Aiden has been an artist from the very beginning. I was fortunate enough to get him linked in with an art therapist when he was little. This interest did not go away over the years. I went back to the same organization after a few year break. And, le and let me just be real, we needed to take a break because I had to choose between paying for art therapy out of pocket and physical therapy. But we eventually went back. and. You know, I knew enough about Aiden that yes, while he needed the art therapy, the art therapy principles, the, how they work to teach him, I also knew that this was a strength of his, and I wanted to ensure that we were that he was actually getting art instruction. Like I was like, this is not just about therapy for him. This is something he's interested in, and he can do something with this if he so chooses as he becomes an adult. And so his teacher and I didn't really know like how this was going to play out in the beginning. Um, but we followed his lead. We tried different things to see what worked. And that's really what we have to do. We can't just go in and say, okay, this is what we want to do. This is how it's going to be. We have to allow that individual to show us the way. And even now to this day, we still, we've been fortunate enough to be working with this um, art therapist slash teacher a number of years now, and we still are figuring it out. And we still still are thinking, okay, how can we set this up to, to help him to independently request something, for example, or, um, 
you know, how, how can we, how can we push him to the next level? And, and that's what it really is about. Also providing opportunities for our child and youth to make choices. So we, as human beings, are all at choice, all of us. Our children and youth deserve the same opportunity. So it might be me asking Aiden, do you want to do yoga today? Do you, do you want to go to the grocery store? or Because like, that's where we go primarily now, right? Um, do you want to go into the grocery store? Or do you want to sit in the car? If you want to sit in the car, then that means that I or Nana will need to sit in the car with you. But he can answer that question. You know, sometimes you have to give, give him options. What do you want for dinner? What movie do you want to watch? You know, and that's the thing. Sometimes he'll, he's able to answer and tell me, you know, yes or no, or stay here. But if he doesn't, the support can be, well, you know, do you want Popeye's for dinner or do you want Pizza Hut? Um, and he can, and he can, and he can make that determination. Um, you also want to teach your child or youth safety skills. This is another important thing in terms of self-advocacy. So I am an African-American woman. My, my son is a, is a young African-American man. Um, and given the state of the world, I'm just going to be honest and say that I am scared for him. But I also am not going to allow that fear to drive me. I have shared these concerns with a school team and his therapist, and we have had conversations and put programs in place to support him. So one of Aiden's IEP goals was to ask him to show his ID um, when, if, if someone asked him a question that they didn't understand related to, you know, well, where do you live? And he goes to answer, he does know his address. Um, but the staff would then say, I don't understand. And that he was, he then learned how to say, can I show you my ID? And literally had to teach him to, before he reached for the ID in his pocket, to ask that question. And then he was able to, you know, once the person acknowledged and said, yes, he then will take the ID out and hold the ID up to the screen because we're, we're still in virtual learning. Also, we as parents have to learn how to let go. So all the part of us, you know, a, a part of all of us growing up really is about learning how to let go. You know, it doesn't matter whether someone is autistic or not. We as parents have to, to understand that our children become adults. And so if you are keeping that in mind, regardless of who they are, we want to ensure that they are able to, to make choices and to live the life that they choose. And sometimes that means that we have to step back a little bit. We have to allow them to make mistakes, but all of that is okay. So just wanted to show you a photo of Aiden so you can see him back in the day. So again, he is an artist, as I said before, and he was doing his art when he was a little guy and he's still doing art to this day. And I think I'm pretty much at time um, but just wanted to share the Chart and Life course um, website and Learn the Science Act Early Materials website. Thank you for your time. And please let me know if you have questions. Participants went into small breakout discussions for 25 minutes. Each breakout discussion was led by either an autistic advocate or a parent advocate and focused on identifying actionable steps to center autistic voices in our personal and professional lives. The following discussion offered facilitators and participants a chance to share any takeaways with the group. Explore, um, to explore what they like, what they don't like, um, and support that um, in compassionate ways. Um, we also talked about um, also ensuring that, especially for parents, that we are seeking out um, the voices of the autistic individual. We recognize that um, it is not our lived experience, most oftentimes as parents, to, to be autistic. And so, you know, as we think about our parent support, while it is a is a great thing, we also want to make sure that we're seeking out um, those views as well, um, so that we can have a well-rounded um, understanding of what autism is and what it means to be an autistic individual. 
Um, anyone else from the group want to throw out another thought that I might have missed in like 30 seconds? Because I'm looking at Paige and I want to make sure we're on time. <laughs> Ms. Yetta, it, it was also brought out that it's important to have family voices around the table with the providers and other people that serve yes, her family. Members. That was key. Thank you, Debbie. Exactly. And making sure that that, um, thank you so much, that, that those voices are also diverse. Um, so not just, okay, let's have an autistic individual that might be white, right? Let's make sure that that autistic individual is of, is of other um, races and backgrounds or ethnicities, um, as well as making sure that the parent voice and the autistic voice are elevated together um, and not overshadowed by the professional voice. So that is something that has, um, that has come out as well. So I'm going to stop there. Thank you all so much for today. Any other facilitators want to chime in or um, anybody else, feel free to unmute if you'd like to share. I'll jump in. It's Carmina. Hi. So, yeah, we had a, a nice little discussion also. Um, some of the key points, of course, I was trying to write really fast, so um, bear with me. So, again, if anybody wants to jump in, I'd appreciate that. So, we talked about how there are so many different levels um, on the spectrum so many different levels. Um, so not one person is alike. So you have to always keep that in mind also um, as a professional. Um, we spoke about how you really should take the time and listen to them because they have something to say. Um, they may take a while. So, you know, we ask a question, you should sit back and just really listen. Um, you may have to ask a question. This is something I had mentioned because I experienced it with my own son. You, you may have to ask that question a few different times in different ways because um, you know he knows the answer. It's just the way it's being asked and then just to have the patience. Um, and the way the world is right now, it's always rush, rush, rush. You know, um, everybody's in such a rush. You need to sit back and take the time to listen to, you know, and make sure you incorporate those voices. Um, I shared how we have a youth group in our state and um, there are many of them um, of individuals that are on the spectrum. And they are just amazing um, with the information that they share. They have a lot to, to say and share. Um, and then another point is, um, oh gosh, does anybody want to jump in? Um, oh, and then uh, somebody had brought up the fact that, you know, Take the time to listen, like they were just talking about family. You know, the family is a very key component of that whole nucleus there. So you want to make sure that you take the time to explain um, and to listen to the parents um, because they're they're there supporting their child um, and they know their child the best. So like when they come into, you know, someone had mentioned that, you know, when they have a, an autistic child or a youth or an individual coming in onto a, um, a committee or a board, they take the time to, to ask them, you know, is there anything that you need, you know, any types of supports? So those are really, really good key points to keep in mind. Um, Great. Thank you, Carmina. Uh, Jess or Haley or anyone else, we have just a few moments left. Um, this is Haley. Um, I'll jump in. We had a really interesting conversation surrounding representation, particularly when we talk about organizations and nonprofits in our communities. And even with conference planning, since we had folks in our group who were parents, we had folks who were conference organizers, we had folks who are in university settings, we had a really interesting and eclectic group of folks. And we were talking about how can we make sure that our nonprofit boards and organizations and planning committees are representative of the autistic community and what does that look like? And also, how do we make sure that we're finding folks who are not only just autistic, but also have diverse backgrounds and who are interested while also respecting their boundaries and access needs and making sure that happens. So it's not just we're getting a small sampling or we're expecting people to overshare because we want information and recognizing that a lot of folks who do go to autism related events that might be sometimes 
some of the only interactions that they've ever had with autistic adults and how do we respect that desire for information and also placing the autistic person's personal boundaries and willingness to share what they're comfortable with first as well. So it was a really wonderful conversation. And if anyone from our group wants to jump in and share anything, that would be really great too, because I know that I'm probably missing something. And we had a really interesting conversation about behavior being communication as well. I think you summed it up very well, Haley. That was definitely the highlight of our conversation. And yes, that last piece that you said is just understanding. Um, Tim mentioned, you know, just understanding that behavior is not just a result of the diagnosis, that understanding that behavior is communication and that no matter diagnosis or not, you really have to look into why is the behavior happening and not just what the behavior is or what the child's diagnosis, or I say child or individual's diagnosis is, is beyond that. So really understanding the why behind the behavior and not just focusing on diagnosis. Thanks, Haley. Awesome. Well, it is, uh, we made it to the top of the hour already and such, such a quick, uh, I guess, eight to 10 minutes, but um, thank you everyone for being here, um, for sharing your thoughts and, and being open to having these discussions. Um, this is uh, not the end. This is only the beginning, um, especially for AMCHIP. We are um, really excited to be on this journey and to have um, some wonderful advocates and voices um, sharing with us and, and providing feedback. So um, to all of you, uh, we uh, will be sending out the, the recording as well as the transcript. Um, and there will be an opportunity to um, offer some feedback through a um, short evaluation that we'll send out within the next day or so. We wanna hear from you. Um, and also, um, you know, if, if you wanna share with us as a technical assistance center, what we can do better, um, we would love to hear that. Um, so thank you everyone, especially thanks to um, Yetta, Jess, Haley, Carmina. Um, I know that Lydia also had to jump off. Um, thank you all so much for being here and being engaged. Um, Thanks, everyone, and uh, have a great day. Thank you. Be Bye. well, everyone.